It had been more than 30 hours since the boat had capsized. Brian and David were still missing, somewhere in the open seas. There are times when I would think a shark might have got him. I just was afraid I was going to have to bury him, with or without a body. I didn't know if I'd ever even see his body again. I wouldn't speak to anybody until they were found. I just watched, kept my eyes on the TV. They were the, my best two friends in the world. Early on the morning of the second day, a local news helicopter piloted by reporter Judd Chapin went to the search area to do a live update. If there was anybody still in the water, we had a good chance of at least covering the rescue as a news story. Cameraman Jim Webb the newspaper photographer Bruce Hoskins were also on board. We're going to just do a, a live shot saying that the search continues and any time we're in an area like that, we assist any way we can. Judd and Jim were in the process of setting up their live broadcast, and I was just killing time. And I thought, well, what the heck, you know, I got two good eyes, I'll, uh, I'll start looking. We're really busy here, so I'll rely on you on audio and video levels. Well, as we were circling around, Judd made a steep bank turn to the left, and I looked down. I think you could call it a miracle. I know if I was in the water and someone spotted me, I wouldn't hesitate at all to call it a miracle. Okay, my position, low end coordinates, 270710. I've got him in the water. He is in a life jacket. When we arrived on scene, he was definitely hurting. He was having a hard time staying afloat. So I landed away from him and taxied up to him. The rotor wash on a helicopter of our size is pretty tremendous. You're, you're talking down wash at about 100 miles an hour. It's very nerve-wracking because that water is no longer water. It's like little needles hitting you. You're in such an intense state of mind of just being out there. It's, you feel very little. You feel like a little speck. You know, you, you realize how small you are compared to the world and how lucky you are to just really be alive. Me and Brian were together. He started hallucinating and, you know, talking to people, talking to his dad, he thought. And he kept swimming off. I couldn't just sit there and wait for Brian, you know. I was like going crazy, just sitting there, and he's swimming off, and he's losing it, and I would, you know, I just couldn't deal with it. I said, I yelled, I said, Brian, I'm swimming for the ship again. I'm heading for the ship. Brian was still missing. Brian's my firstborn, and I was afraid to answer the phone. I, I didn't want to hear bad news, and when and when they and I would stay glued to the TV. And, but when it starts to come on, you, and you're afraid you're going to hear something negative, and it, it's, it's it just the inside of you, it's like it's trying to tear apart. We were celebrating, just patting each other on the back on board the Eagle, and a few minutes later we were thinking, oh, it really would be nice. It really would be real nice if we were the ones to spot the second guy. Here's my life ref. Just found the second guy across the second life preserver. This guy! Does he appear to be alive? You tell? I tell you what, We all knew just at a glance that this guy wasn't too long for this world. My biggest fear was that this guy's gonna go under in front of us, and I don't want to be the one to record it. Because if we record it, we'll probably run it. And nothing's worse than knowing you shot it and the family's going to see it. The man is too weak to get into the, into the basket. He is too weak. So they have a, now, John, what can they do? Uh, the Coast Guard boat swinging in right into him right now. 
This man has been treading water for many, many hours. It's a pretty good feat for someone with all their strength to get into this basket in the water if they're not familiar with the equipment. For someone that's exhausted after two and a half days, it becomes almost an impossible thing for them to do. Fabulous story. We're sticking with it for extended coverage here on YouTube. I can't imagine what it would be like to be in the water that long. And the frustration that they must have felt seeing helicopters fly over them for two days and not, not be able to attract their attention. For somebody in that situation to be able to, to stick it out and not give up is the whole key. I'd say that they were extremely lucky. If you do happen to get into a situation where your vessel is overturned, to stay with the vessel. It's much easier to find the boat than it is just the person floating. He's on board. 36 hours after their boat went down, the last of the three was pulled from the sea. They were all suffering from dehydration and jellyfish stings, but grateful to the people who found them. Bruce, thank you very much. You saved my life, and I love you. Miraculously, all three escaped without permanent injury. Losing the two of them would have been losing a part of me. It would have been losing out on a lot of my future because they're, of course, going to be in my future. I learned a lot from it. Never go out in the water without a radio. Never go out in the water without a blow-up raft. Never go out in the water, <laughs> basically. <laughs> If you can't see land, it's too far. Yeah. Next, when I arrived on the scene,